Well, good morning, friends. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning at Trinity United Methodist Church. My name is Marissa Copeland, and it is my joy to welcome you to worship on this day. And welcome especially to our friends who are joining us online. We would love to know where you're worshiping from, so please place wherever you're tuning in from in the comment section. We would love to hear uh, and to get to know you a little bit. Today has been a wonderfully and beautifully full day. At our 9.30 service, we uh, had the opportunity to give our third graders their, first, their Bibles, uh, and it was a beautiful time of praying over them and being with them, and the spirit of excitement and joy is definitely still in this room. Today... Um, we are beginning our new worship series entitled um, Brave Faith, based on the book Courage and the Call and Jesus and the Call to Brave Faith, written by our bishop here of the Florida Conference, Bishop Tom Berlin. But before we uh, get there, whether it's your first time here, here or you've been here lots of times, we invite you to just take a few minutes to fill out something we call a Connect card. You can do this online or you can fill out the paper Connect card that you will receive in your bulletins or follow the QR code that is on your screens. And doing this is so helpful to us because first it lets us know that you're here and it gives you the opportunity to share with us some prayer requests that you might have so that we as a pastoral team can pray over you throughout the week. It also gives you an opportunity to let us know some of the ways that you might want to step deeper into the life of Trinity United Methodist Church and places that you want to learn some more information. So please just take a few moments to fill that out. We are incredibly thankful for those. Now friends, since we are stepping into a series about brave faith, we know that we, in all of our lives, from all the places that we have been, uh, exhibit moments of bravery uh, in our lives. And we are invited to this space to take a deep breath, to rest in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit that is already here with us, filling us and reviving us so that we can step back out later and to continue leaning into the courage that God gifts us. So it is my joy to say to you today, welcome home. Indeed, it is great. And I invite you to stand and to greet your neighbors this morning. Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. As you're finishing up your conversations and moving back to your seat, would you remain standing as you're able, and let's begin our worship with a song. Days and 
you join me in affirming our faith with the statement of faith that you'll find on the screens. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you all today's mission focus, our opportunity to bless an organization in our community community that is doing important and transformative work. This week, that is Mirror Image Leadership Academy, um, an organization that is just a little bit over two years old now. I had the opportunity to meet founder and visionary Greg Bradley right as he was launching uh, this really, uh, really impactful program in our community. And at that point, he was just starting with one group of rising seventh grade boys. And a little over two years later, uh, there is now a cohort of ninth grade boys, eighth grade boys, and seventh grade boys, which was the vision for the program that uh, every year they would have uh, young men in each of those age categories, about 25 in each for a total of 75 young people. Um, going through this leadership development program. I'm going to give you a moment to watch a video that will give you a taste of what they've been doing this summer through their excursion uh, or exposure trips um, that give them the opportunities to see things they might not other be able, be, be able to experience. So take a look and then we'll come back with a, another word about them. Hello everyone, my name is James Miller. I'm the Executive Director at Mirror Image Leadership Academy. And I would like to take a moment to thank our partners, our donors, and our supporters for your contribution to our organization this year. Please check out this highlight reel of our local, national, and international experiences during our Summer Academy this summer. Once again, if you wanna know more about Mirror Image Leadership Academy, be sure to go to mirrorimageleadership.org. Thank you again and see how you can make a difference.
It really is remarkable to see how far this organization has come in just its first couple of years here in our community. And one of the things I love about them is their starting point is the, the foundational scripture in Genesis that they use to constantly remind these young men that they are made in the image of God, created with sacred worth and divine purpose. And from that, they can choose to do and become anything they want to do and become um, as a child of God. What a great starting point for all of us, right? Um, So I invite you to bless them with a special gift today. In addition to our regular tithes and offerings, you can make a gift uh, and note it specifically for uh, Mirror Image. Um, James Miller, you may have met James on the way in today. He is here with us. James, will you wave from back there? I see him back. Yep, James is here with us today. He's the executive director you saw at the beginning of the video. And there's a table set up outside. If you'd like to learn more about what they're doing, uh, James would love to talk to you. Thanks so much. gather as a community to pray this morning, one of the things that I want to invite you to be in prayer for are the third graders who receive their Bibles. There are 16 third graders, um, 15 of whom were able to be present with us today, and all of those 16 will receive Bible, have have received Bibles, or, or one will. And I believe that we have those photos, and I would love to read their names for you and invite you then as we go into this time of prayer to be praying for these students. So Luke Bagby, Lillian Blake, Madeline Bogler, David Brown, L. Clugston, Lillian Jackson, Drake Lee, Nolan Long, Noah Nagley, Victoria Perez, Emma Pinkison, Aiden Ream, Hunter Sutherland, Colton Trosper, Trace White. So as we go to God in prayer, I want you to lift up these kids, each of them receiving a Bible today, and that as they receive the Bible as the Word of God, that they will come to know through those words the Word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come today and we seek your courage and hope for the future. Our world is is in need, and in the midst of the darkness and fear, you call us to be a community, a community that lives through peace, love, and courage. You remind us of the blessings we have and the opportunities to share those blessings with others. We praise and thank you for all of these things and for your constant presence with us. Today, as a community, we lift up prayers of healing. We pray for all those who were affected by the earthquake in Morocco, for those who have lost loved ones and and, and everything that they know and love. We pray for those who um, were in the path of Hurricane Idalia as they continue to recover. We pray again for those who have lost property and and things that they value in their community, and especially for anyone who has lost loved ones. And we pray for the early release, early response team at Trinity and and the ways different groups are going out to be the hands and feet of Jesus in those communities that were hit by Idalia. And oh God, this morning we, we offer as well prayers of joy and thanksgiving for all that is happening in our lives and and in for us as a community of faith. We especially thank you for each one of these children, precious in your sight and precious to us. We pray that we will be a part of a family of faith that nurtures and encourages them so that they will come to know that they are loved by this community, that they are loved by their families, and that they are loved by you, O God, in the grace and power of Jesus Christ. We are confident in your abiding presence with us. And help us to be faithful to you in all times and all places. 
Give us the grace to accept the forgiveness that you offer to each one of us as we seek to live as your followers. In the name of Christ, we pray, and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, you are in for a special treat today um, because at this point in the service, we're going to pivot from what you see in your bulletin, and uh, we've made a we've made a switcheroo. And today, instead of me preaching, you're going to get the blessing of hearing from Reverend Dr. Gary Mason. Uh, if you've been around Trinity for a while, you possibly have heard Gary preach before. He's been with us several times over the last few years. And um, uh, Gary is a clergyman from Northern Ireland who Catherine and I first had the joy of meeting back in 2016 uh, when we were part of a cohort. 
of Florida pastors in the Methodist Church uh, invited to learn from Gary about matters of peace building and reconciliation. Uh, Gary has a lot of experience in that space from his work during the Troubles in Northern Ireland um, as a clergyman on the front lines of the struggle. And as a result of that work, he has been invited into other contexts to teach and to inform and to inspire uh, the Israeli-Palestinian context, the American context with political and religious divisions. Um, and so we are just so grateful to have spent some time this weekend with Gary and his wife Joyce. Uh, we always enjoy having that time together as couples and pleased that he can bring a word of encouragement and challenge to us this morning. Would you join me in welcoming Gary? I mean, undoubtedly, a book that Steve, Catherine, Marissa uh, read when you were training theologically was St. Augustine's Confessions. So I am here this week because I made the mistake of thinking I was coming this week when I was meant to be coming next week. Uh, so I was up in Tallahassee uh, speaking there on Friday evening and also Saturday morning was driving down on my assumption that I was preaching here today, but didn't read the email correctly. The series began today. I was meant to be here next week. So Steve and Catherine did a quick maneuvering of staff and rather make me drive to Orlando and drive back here next week. Uh, when I had another preaching engagement, they reconfigured. So I just want to thank them for their flexibility on that. February last year, March last year, I know what every single person in this building was doing. You were doing exactly the same as I was doing. You were gripped either in CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, or BBC like me, wondering, will it happen? Will it not happen? Will Russia invade Ukraine? And we highlighted so many times that surely Europe wouldn't spill back into some chaotic war. In fact, my second oldest son, Kirk, texts me and said, Dad, is there going to be a nuclear war? And for all of us who are primarily post-Second World War generation, I had an uncle fought, uh, rescued at uh, Dunkirk, went in on the second day of D-Day. Never would I have dreamed in my wildest dreams that any kid of mine would be saying, Dad, is there going to be a nuclear war? Looking at that theater just at the moment, it's interesting. People are asking the question, Kiev, Kiev, Kiev. Why is Vladimir Putin obsessed with Kiev? Religion. Toxic religious leadership. Because that battle is not just geopolitics. Because I'm going to tell you about another Vladimir, not Vladimir Putin, Vladimir the Rus, who a thousand years ago in Kiev was converted to Christianity. And he insisted on a mass baptism in the Depner River in Kiev. So literally, there and then in Kiev, the Holy Mother Russian Orthodox Church was born. And that's one of the reasons why Russia is so obsessed with Kiev. Why is that? What is happening there? What is happening is simply this, is what I call toxic politics and toxic religion is mixing. In a cathedral in Russia at the moment, inside a cathedral, a place of worship, there is a picture of Archbishop Kirill the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Stalin, a mass murderer, and Vladimir Putin. Iconic pictures, sanctified by, in inverted commas, a Christian church. Archbishop Creel called Vladimir Putin a miracle, a gift from God. Uh, categorically and unashamedly, I say this, Putin is a rapist, genocidal, a murderer, and is not a gift from God. He's a gift from Satan. So leadership in the 21st century. Who do we look to? 
Well, I'm going to take us way, way back in time, actually 4,000 years ago. And I just want to read two very short texts from the book of Genesis, because I'm going to talk about a real, transparent follower of God, Abraham, your father and my father. So it's okay to flip those up. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your land, your family, and your father's household. For the land that I will show you, I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. All the families of earth will be blessed because of you. And just moving into the book of Hebrews, we have there in chapter 11 and 12 that kind of hall of faith. And it says this about Abraham. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was going to receive. As an inheritance he went out without knowing where he was going. By faith he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. It's an amazing text that, to have the ability to look forward, to look forward to a city whose foundation is in God. Catherine, in her prayer, alluded to what was happening there in Morocco, and interestingly, uh, Joyce and I had a conversation. My wife, who works alongside me and travels with me, we actually talked this January about going to Marrakesh. Uh, which wasn't as badly devastated as parts of Morocco, but was devastated. So even our greatest architectural foundations are not secure. But Abraham categorically said, I'm looking to a secure foundation, a foundation that is built on the living God. The brilliant Jewish theologian, Jonathan Sachs, writing about Abraham, said this, Abraham is the paradigm of an own heroic hero who does what is right because it is right and not for the sake of popularity or fame. The New York Times, there a couple of years ago, uh, wrote an article on that interesting topic of humility. I'm saying that everybody has discovered humility today. Pop stars, politicians, yoga teachers, actors, they will tweet, I am humbled by my followers. It begs the question, in the first place, are they really that humble? Uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, caustic quotations was from a movie I saw the other night. The quotation wasn't in it, but Joyce and I, with two friends in Orlando, went to see the movie Golda, Golda Meir, who's the only uh, woman uh, um, prime minister of Israel. And Golda Meir had a very, I like her cheeky sense of humor. I confess my sins in that. And someone was once in her office, and she said to him, don't be humble, you're not that great. Brilliant. <laughs> so it is. So in reality today, everyone wants to be humble. But the New York Times suggests that this was a very superficial humility. And that's when I look at Abraham's life. In reality, if you want to define it, he was true to the principles of the call of eternity, not the noise of now. And for all of us who live in this 21st century world, if we're honest, the noise of now at times closets out the principles and the call of eternity. And I know as you move through this series over the next couple of weeks, I want you to ask that question. 
What does leadership look like? Not superficial, deceptive, duplicit leadership, but what does leadership look like that is true to the call of eternity? Not the continuous noise and buzz of now. And Sachs further commenting on Abraham's life uses that uh, phrase, lika lika, which means go by yourself. And in reality, as you look at Abraham's life, if we're going to be children of Abraham today, and all of us are descendants of Abraham, you have to be the courage to be different, to challenge the idols of this age. And if we were to look back in time in an area of polytheism, it meant seeing this universe as the product of a single creative will, not meaningless, but coherent, meaningful. In an era of slavery, it meant refusing to accept the status quo in the name of God, but challenging it in the name of God. When power was worshipped, it meant having a theology, a society that occurred for the powerless, the marginalized, the ostracized, the widow, and the orphan. And during centuries when humankind was sunk in ignorance, it meant honoring education as the key to human dignity and creating schools to provide universal literacy. And when war was a test of manhood, it meant striving for peace. And today in our so-called sophisticated 21st century, in an era of radical individualism, it means knowing that we are not what we own, but what we share, not what we buy, but what we give, that there's something higher than all our individual appetites and desires, a call that comes to all of us in this building today as it came to Abraham from outside ourselves, but it summons each of us in this building to make a contribution to this world. I just want to highlight shortly and briefly four things I see in Abraham's life that I hope are helpful. The first concept that I want to highlight in his life is expectations. Abraham hears this call. And Abraham, like us, was very normal. He struggled with this voice. I will give you and your descendants an everlasting possession as for you. He used that personal pronoun. I will make a covenant with you. You must keep the covenant and teach it to your children. And Catherine alluded to those younger kids that got their Bibles. You are doing what God said to Abraham, passing the teaching, the covenant, the blessings to generation to generation. And I hope all those younger kids whose pictures we saw earlier and the world is vying for their attention, and a world that promises everything but in reality delivers emptiness and nothing. It's important as a church. You teach those children and their children eternal principles. I also see in Abraham's life something that's in all of your lives and in mine. Ask my wife. Imperfection. Because Abraham fails to keep the covenant. All of us in this building have failed to keep the covenant. But despite that, God holds Abraham tightly. He was mixed up, wavering back and forward, faith and doubt, asking questions that I know all of you have asked in this building. God, how am I to know? It just reeks of doubt. Abraham, with all his imperfections, how can I know? And so I know we're just sitting in church today because all of us have this ability to critique ourselves. I couldn't do this. I'd never be able to do leadership in the public space. The Bible is, to me, the most dysfunctional book on the planet. Why do I say that? Read it. It's filled with people like you and me. People who made mistakes, failed relationships, 
Murder, deception, trickery, lying, it's all there. I mean, Noah, who we teach our kids about in Sunday school, we always leave that bit out understandably, where there's a little bit too much wine and a bit of nakedness. But Noah was still a person of God. Moses, a person we talk about 3,000 years later, I mean, Moses was in exile for 40 years. I'm sure this isn't a gossipy church, but if you were, if Mr. Moses was a member here and hadn't been here for 40 years, I'm sure some of the town gossips in Gainesville would be saying, well, stuff Mr. Moses. He's messed his life and ministry up completely, but God wasn't finished with him. Because 40 years after that incident, as we all know, at that burning bush, God recommissions Moses. So I want you as a church to never give up on people. Because we have that tendency to do that. Uh, Philip Yancey, who I alluded to earlier, uh, has written a very, very short book, a series of short reflections entitling, I Was Just Wondering. And one of those articles he entitles The Midnight Church. And he meets his friend Bob. And he says, hey, Bob, I, I haven't seen you at church lately. And Bob, who was a chronic alcoholic, said, no, I, I go to AA. I find in AA I am accepted. I mean, let's be honest. Churches and religion can be the most judgmental, demeaning aspect of life on planet Earth. He was able to stand up in AA and say, my name is Bob, I'm an alcoholic. Stay here. We'll help you. We'll embrace you. I did a TED a Theo talk last year in Atlanta. And I know you've had this LGBTQ debate, and I'm quite sure there's many diverse views in this church, and that's fine, that's called life. But my teaching assistant a number of years ago at Candler School of Theology, where I lecture, was a young woman called Jen Carlisle. I'm telling you her story because she did a Ted Theo talk along with me. She was struggling with her sexuality. Badly. She turned to alcohol. And the church turned her back on her. And she did a Ted Theo talk with me last year. Google it. If you're interested, just Google Theo Talks. Don't listen to mine. Hers is much better. And she, her talk was entitled, Finding God in the Basement. Where was the basement? Below the church. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. She should have found God in the church, but the church disowned her. She found God in the basement. What does that say about leadership in the church? I sometimes cheekingly and teasingly in days when I was pastoring churches, I'm more kind of like a Wesleyan itinerant lecturer and preacher now, but I often used to say, I have two people here I want to bring on my leaders board or church council. What phrase do you call? What do you call leaders board? Yeah, church council, yeah. And I said, their name is uh, uh, Damien and Samuel. I says, now Damien, a little bit of a uh, bit of murder there, a bit of extramarital sex. Now, as regards this other gentleman uh, called Samuel, he sort of screwed up a bit religiously. He got a bit confused theologically. Who should we bring on? Oh, 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 oh let's bring on Samuel. And I said, I lied. I lied. Their names are David and Saul. So Saul messes up theologically, doesn't he? Kind of does this little sacrifice thing, doesn't get his theology exactly right. David, like murder and extramarital sex. What's the difference in David and Saul's life? One simple thing, repentance. Saul never wrote that great penitential prayer, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgressions. Restore your spirit within me. Real leaders know how to repent. And as we look back, what's in David's tombstone? 
Joyce and I have allegedly visited where he's buried in Jerusalem. He may or may not be there. But according to the Scriptures, what does it say? A person after God's own heart. So I'm saying to you as a church and to the leadership of this church, both lay and ordained, never ever give up on another person. Because God doesn't give up on people. The third thing I want to highlight in Abraham's life is this. Acceptance. You know that horrendous passage. I just wish it wasn't in the Torah, to be honest. I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and take him to Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. All of us identify with Abraham there. Because into your life and into my life, let's be honest, what do you do when life doesn't make sense? Things happen. We're left to group for reasons to make sense out of it, and many, many times we simply come up empty. But you know what the real revelation was in that story, despite all the melodrama? The real revelation was when God stopped Abraham from thrusting the knife through Isaac's heart. And that revelation continues because the point is this. When life no longer made sense, Abraham obeyed anyway. And most of us interpret that story, and to a degree it's correct. I'll tell you why that story is in there, Gary. It because it explains why the Hebrew faith alone in the ancient world, rejected child sacrifice. Okay. But it's also a symbol of holy ground, a place where radical obedience to God and deep religious faith was implemented. There's a writer called Mark Baderson. He's written this book with the strangest title called In a Pit with a Lion, on a snowy day. And he says this about life. Some of the best things in life are totally unplanned and unscripted. He said, I'm not a movie critic, but my humble entertainment estimation, the greatest movies have the highest levels of uncertainty. Whether the uncertainty is romantic or dramatic, Scripts with the highest levels of uncertainty make the best movies. In the same vein, I think high levels of uncertainty make the best lives. What was Abraham's life? Abraham was a faith that embraced the uncertainties of life. Abraham was able to recognize a divine appointment when he saw it. I suppose as a church, you need to ask yourselves the question, whatever the future holds for this church, how you develop this amazing site to minister the 21st century. A divine appointment is recognizing that when you see it. So embrace relational uncertainty. It's called romance. Embrace spiritual uncertainty. It's called mystery. Embrace occupational uncertainty. It's called destiny. Embrace intellectual uncertainty. It's called revelation. The last thing I want this church, which I have a deep high regard for, and I preach in a lot of churches globally, this is a good church led by solid people. Make your lives an adventure of faith. Don't embrace boring institutional religion. Abraham didn't. And the final thing I want to highlight is this. Resolve. Now, unless Jesus comes back, all of us in this building are going to have an experience, not necessarily together, but it's going to happen to all of us. We're all going to be probably on a deathbed. So what did Abraham do when he was on his deathbed? What was on his mind? 
How much is in my will? Who will my property go to? No, what was on his mind was the covenant God had made with him. Because when he was ready to die, Abraham wanted to get a wife for Isaac. Children, carry on the covenant. And he asked one of his servants to go and get Isaac a wife, but he said this, see to it that you do not take my son back there. And he underlines it again a couple of verses later, do not take my son back there. And one of the problems in church, as we all know, is we keep looking back to those great days of church. I've heard those stories sometimes from older clergy who would have said to me, you know, Gary, in uh, Northern Ireland in the 1950s and 60s, our churches were filled. And maybe the cynic in me, or hopefully the kind of low-level prophet in me said, oh, really? Well, your gift to my generation was a bloody sectarian war. Why? Because the churches didn't have the courage to deal with latent sectarianism, toxic politics, and toxic religion, and deal with a sectarian cockpit that pushes in the 30 years of political violence. Oh yeah, you were stuffing yourselves with gospel blessings, while underneath, politically and religiously, we were teetering on the brink. And that's why you need those leadership. I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I don't live here, and to be honest, I really don't care if some of you are Republicans or some of you are Democrats. Uh, when I travel back to Orlando, uh, I've been staying for 10 days with close Republican friends who are people of faith. On Wednesday, I travel three miles to stay with close Democratic friends who are people of faith. And trust me, they're, they're pretty normal, seriously, to all your Republicans, Democrats, very normal people just like you. So what has happened in the United States? Why is politics dominating this space so much? Because as all of you know, even if you disagree with your Republican or Democratic neighbor or friend, I mean, politics is temporal. The gospel's eternal. As one writer recently said, Politics has a strong grip on our hearts. The gospel's grip should be stronger. And I challenge you all unashamedly. What is really the most important thing in your life? Your relationship with the eternal Christ or an obsession with politics? Maybe you need to switch off your news channels. Let me tell you a story. I was preaching in St. Petersburg there a couple of years ago, and Joyce, my wife, is very balanced around politics, so she watched a bit of CNN, and then she flipped over to Fox News, and then back to CNN, and back to Fox News, and in a fit of marital anger, I said to her, Joyce, get me the BBC. I'd had enough of listening to this eternal politics. <laughs> That's what I did, you know. So maybe I should have said, Joyce, don't get me the BBC. Get me Jesus Christ. And so I appeal to you as someone who has lived through a civil war. When I was a little boy, 1972, we had a terrorist incident every 40 minutes. You imagine what my childhood, my childhood looked like. And I've appealed to, I'm working with both Republicans and Democrats in this state and in Georgia and in the Carolinas, bringing them together for quiet conversations, saying, can we focus on the eternal? This is a great nation. But what made this nation great was leadership centered on the eternal. And I just make an appeal to you as a, as a close friend and a close ally of the United States, my Uncle Jimmy, who went in with some of your uh, relatives on D-Day, Normandy landings. So this nation's very close to my heart. Don't mess it up for the sake of the temporal. As a leadership and as a church, I ask you with grace and dignity and with deep respect, focus on the eternal. Abraham did, and you saw what they said about him, 
thousands of years after his death in Hebrews, he built his life on a city whose foundation is a living God. Do likewise. Amen. As we come to this whole time of Holy Communion, I invite those who are joining us online to grab elements from your homes or the places in which you're watching, bread, crackers, juice, or wine. We invite you to this meal together because it is here at this holy table where we are grounded in the eternal, where we remember that it is God's faithfulness combined with the convicting courage of Jesus Christ that we find ourselves here as children of grace, where we are reminded that we are beautifully and wonderfully made in the image of God, that we are all imperfect people invited to a place where our imperfections do not matter because it is Christ within us working to transform each of our hearts and our minds, our lives, to look more and more like Christ's. And so we remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks to you, O God, and broke that bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when that supper was over, he then took the cup, gave thanks to you, O God, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so, my friends, this morning we are invited to come to this table to come and taste and see the goodness of God, to experience the grace offered to us by a courageous Jesus, to point us back to the eternal. Will you join me in prayer? O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, O oh God, make us one, one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we can share a meal of peace at that heavenly banquet. All honor and glory as yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I invite those who are serving communion to come forward at this time. And as they do, I want to remind each of you that in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open communion table. That means you do not have to be a member of this church or any church to come forward and to receive the blessings, this gift of grace that is freely offered to each of us. As you make your way forward, you are also invited to place any offerings, both for the mission focus and your regular tithes and offerings in the offering boxes before you or in the rear of the worship center. My friends, come. Come and taste and see the goodness of God. The table is now ready.
will you pray with me? Oh God, for this gift of a holy meal, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this mystery of faith where we come before you and are empowered and transformed to become more like Christ, to rest on that which is eternal, to go forth and to carry the gift of love to others. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn? Church of God united to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts in glad accord. Christ ever goes before us, we follow day by day with strong and eager footsteps along the upward way. From every land and nation, the ordered ranks appear to serve one valiant leader. They come from far and near. They chant their one confession. They pray one living Lord and place their sure dependence upon his saving word. Though creeds and tongues may differ, they speak, O Christ, of thee, and in thy loving spirit we shall one people Again, we are so grateful for Gary's presence with us this morning and the word of courage and conviction that he has shared. He'll be outside afterwards, and I hope that you will take a moment and greet him and definitely greet others as well on your way out this morning. Okay. Let's just pray together. Gracious God, we pray that this church would be a church that's grounded in the eternal, that our differences may exist from the grand scheme of life and eternity. Help us to focus on that city built by God with eternal foundations. In Jesus' name, amen.